Patricia Talks. Welcome to Patricia Talks, the show where you get to hear stories from everyday people about their extraordinary lives, from authors to sports personalities, TV personalities and entrepreneurs. Welcome to Patricia Talks. My special guest today is the amazing Paul Dawkins, singer, songwriter, musical pioneer of reggae in the UK industry. Paul Dawkins, I'm so excited. It's my absolute pleasure Thanks. to I'm welcome glad to be you. Here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming down to London. Right. So Paul, pioneer, musical pioneer, UK reggae artist, singer, mm -hmm. songwriter, mm -hmm. for more than 50 years. Well, March the 13th um, next month, it will make it 50 years. Wow. I know you're going to ask my age, but you've got to calculate that for yourself. Well, actually, <laughs> I have to say, I was pretty surprised when I found out it was that many years. Right. That's a lot of decades. Lot. And so you've got lots to talk about. Yeah, lots to talk about. Super. So I'm going to ask you to go way back then, really, and tell me a little bit about your background, where's your family from, um, and then bring us up to date. Well, my family from Jamaica, Clarendon, um, came over early 50s. Um, and when they came over, they lived in Kilburn first, moved to Paddington, then Kensal Rise, then we ended up in Neasden. Um, went to um, Braincroft School first, and then from Braincroft School went to Ju High School, and that was John Kelly School I went to. Paul, do you have some siblings? Yeah, I've got seven sisters and one brother. Seven sisters and one brother? One brother. And where are you in the ranking? Second. You're the second? <laughs> yeah, second. So Paul, we've just discussed that you've had over 50 years, or it's going to be 50, 50 years, years in the music yeah. industry. Tell me when you first became interested in music. Well, believe it or not, when I was about, I think about seven, eight years old, a lot of, a lot of people don't really, I don't think we remember, there was another uh, st pop station on television called Ready, Steady, Go. It wasn't Top of the Pops. It was called Ready, Steady, Go. You can look it up. It's I think there. it was probably before my time, but it does, <laughs> sa it does sound familiar. So Ready, yeah. Steady, Go. So I used, to, I used to, you know, I remember taking my dad's belt and putting the broomstick through it and trying to play a guitar and follow them along what, what, what they were playing, but not realising that today it would have led me to where I am today. Wow. You know, so um, went to, after that, went to Braincroft School, left from there, went to John Kelly, and, they, you know, you could do woodwork and all different kinds of things in school. So I actually started to make a guitar, my first bass guitar, mm. not knowing that's what I'd end up playing. It was just a guitar. What guitar do you want to uh, make, Paul? And I said, a bass guitar, not realising that's what I would play when I did leave school. Um, well, in going to school, living in Neasden, my cousin, George Oban, mm. um, one of the founders of Aswad, we all went to church together, me, George, and um, Tony Gadd. But at the time, obviously, his name is Tony Robinson. So we was playing in the church. And George said, look, let's form a little band. So we got together, me, George, and Tony, and um, started to rehearse at church and in each other's houses. And we needed a guitarist. So mm. we didn't know anybody at the time who had a guitar, but we heard that Brinsey now, Brinsey Ford, from, who plays in Aswad, mm. he lived on the North Circular Road. At that time, we weren't really friends moving around as, you know, going to the park and playing football, but we knew of him, because by that time he was doing double-deckers, oh, oh please, yeah. sir. So we went down to his house, knocked his door, and I remember his mum opened the door, and we asked for him, and then he came out. We said, look, we heard you've got a guitar. And he goes, yeah, I've got a guitar, but there's no strings on it. And I can't, I'm not really, I'm not really a guitar player. So look, we said, don't worry about that. Tony Gadd will show us and teach us because he was really good. Tony Gadd is a very good musician. He knew the chords and so did George Oban. Then we started to rehearse together. So did the guitar literally have no strings? Yeah, only a couple of strings on okay. the guitar. You know, back okay. in the day, you know, you've got yeah, a guitar yeah, sure. with about three, because yeah. guitar strings are very easy to break. So we just started to rehearse at my house, George's house, and also in Brinsley's garage, what was at the side of his house. Mm. Um, then we got a friend named Joe, he came from Wilson, and then he became the singer in the band. And there's also Charlie. He was meant to be the drummer, but he'd just come from Jamaica. So I remember the first time we was going to do a lot of thing. He said, he wants to be a drummer. And, and it's so funny, he got a dustbin lid. Because back in the days, he had those metal dustbins. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. And he got that, put it on a stick and turned the dustbin upside down. He just got some sticks and started to play on the drum. But it was so, it was so funny, but we, we, we loved it at the time. 
So it was. It was so was that his first experience of drumming? Yes, I think it was. Oh wow! <laughs> you know, but so that's interesting because you've got the broomstick and the belt. Yeah. And he's got the bin and the bin lid. Yeah. And some sticks. Yeah. And so it shows actually really that you were really really creative as young people. Yeah, I think we were laying out the path. You it, know, it, it sounds like you were. So Paul, I want to take you back a little bit though because you mentioned that your family came to the UK right. uh, from Jamaica, and so you grew up in a household and right. in an era where the front room was quite a phenomenal place in, in, in the household. Oh, yes. Uh, and you also spoke about church. And right. what was familiar about them was that after church, you would go home and you'd play music. What sort of music were you hearing at home, aside of Ready, Steady, Go? Well, my dad has, has, has um, his blue spot gram, as all fathers in, you know, in mm-hmm. that community had. Um, the first song I really, really heard was My Boy Lollipop. I remember my dad bringing it home and putting it on the player. And when it went down, that's when the first time I really heard reggae music mm-hmm. coming from Jamaica. And I remember every time my dad went through the door, me and my sisters were going there. At the time, three of my sisters would go in there and keep playing it back and forward, back and forward until you know, I got used to that, mm. to that reggae sound. So that's when I first heard you know, reggae music as we know it today. Sure. So you played uh, the song back and back. The fact that you could actually go into the front room is something quite Oh yeah, my dad, in, he, didn't rest- he didn't restrict us from going in there. That's one thing I can say. My dad allowed us to go in there. Just as long as we didn't break any of the, the glasses mm. or take any of his drink. <laughs> nice, I like that, I like that. So Paul, you spoke about My Boy Lolly Pop and that being a record that you played first at home. Yeah. Can you remember the first record that you ever bought and where did you buy it from? Oh my gosh. No, uh, well the first record I bought I think was in Kensal Rise. There was a record shop just on the corner. I can't remember the name of the record mm. shop. But I can't actually remember the first record I bought. It was so long ago. Oh, right. You know, okay. I can't actually remember. Or where you used to buy your record. You can't remember Yeah, it was that. in Kensal Rise. In that, it, oh, it was in that record shop. Yeah, on the yeah. corner of Kensal Rise, just over where the station is. Um, when I, when, 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 at that time, I started to work. So leaving from work on a Friday, we'd all stop at a record shop. Mm-hmm. Most guys would just stop there on a Friday. We'd buy our special brews. They used to come in little bottles and we'd be inside a record shop. Guys would be outside, and once you heard the song, what you record, what you wanted, you put up your hand, and then when you look on the desk, you see your, 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 all the records be oh, piling brilliant. up, piling up, and it'd be your pile. So by the time you you leave you leave the record shop, maybe three, four hours, you leave maybe about six or seven pre-release music. That sounds like an auction. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was it no, like an auction? Yeah, and if you did, if you did, if you you'd go like that, and if you if you didn't have it, you say you're gonna come back next week for it because maybe three other guys have got. Mm. Those, those three songs, so that's how it was. You know? So was music being imported to the UK then? Oh yes, definitely, yeah. A lot of imports came in. Most of the pre-releases came in from Jamaica. Because by that time, there wasn't a lot of bands making music over here. Mm. So most of the stuff was coming from Jamaica. Um, there was many record shops all over the place at that time. So you could really go anywhere. If you didn't get it in, in um, Kensal Rise, you'd mm. go to Harlesden or you'd go to Brixton, wherever it was, you know you'd get that pre-release, you'd go, you'd go and get it. Sure. So Paul, let's think about uh, the fact that you know you've used the broomstick, the belt. Uh, your friend drummer has created mm-hmm. his own drums. Where did you guys go from there? Well, as I said, what, when we moved on from there, it was with George and me, Brinsley and Tony. Mm-hmm. And um, what happened was, and Joe, George had to go back to Jamaica. So George had to go because of his parents, and we was all young guys. So George said, "Look, Paul, whatever you do, keep the band going till when I come back." Mm. So George left, that just left me and Brinsley. Tony was more into the church than we were, so Tony kind of laid back a bit. But so me and Brinsley was on the road doing talent contest shows, and there's one talent contest show we went to, and that was down at Bedford Hall in Willesden. Mm. We went in, it was just drum uh, and bass and rhythm guitar. And by the time we finished for the night, we actually won the, won the contest. Fantastic. And I think- So it was oh, just instrumental, no, no yeah, singing? Yeah, no, no singing at all, no singing. And then, um, I think the following week we heard that Junior English was looking for a bass player and a guitarist and we couldn't believe that you know someone said yeah these mm. two guys are there so went down to the rehearsal place um, and it was Graham from the Mohawks they actually done Let It Be the first reggae version of mm. Let It Be the Beatles and then um, John Baker was on drums Graham was on keyboards I was on bass Brinsley was on guitar and then Evan was a singer so it was it was an experience to actually be being a band now, mm. knowing that we're going to be back in another singer. We was very, we didn't know what we were doing, but as time went on, we started to learn and we learned the songs. And next thing you know, we was on stage with Junior. I love that because that really takes me back to a time where we didn't see, I guess, much performances 
and we, I don't know what you were saying on Ready Steady Go, but we didn't really see those performances in mainstream. So where were you performing? Well, we was going like Birmingham, Manchester, Huddersfield, Leeds. We was, it, June was doing more shows out of London than in London. We mm -hmm. had one or two shows in London with Sir um, Coxon. Mm -hmm. We've done a show with him. Um, and quite a few other places, but most of the shows what Junior was doing, they were out of London. So obviously we're getting a van together with the equipment mm. and all of us in the back of the van and we'd hit down the motorway. That's what we would do. How old were you at that time? I was 15. Had you, had you finished school? Oh yeah, I was out of school, yeah. But in between that, obviously I had my trade. Because you know, when you left school in those days, you could go straight into a trade. So mm. I made sure that I did get myself into a trade. So if anything would happen, I could always have something to fall back on. As my dad would say, make sure you've got a trade or you've sure. learned something so you, can, you yeah. can move on in life. Absolutely. And that's what I've done. So you've, you've mentioned some of my greats. So Junior English, I adore mm -hmm. Junior English. And you, you've spoken about Brinsley and the fact yeah. that he actually did acting as well as singing. So that, that, was, that was really important. And so you got to back Junior English. Mm -hmm. Who else did you work with? Well, when, when, after Junior's band mm -hmm. had, had finished, then after I joined the group Tradition. So we ended up backing people like um, Delroy Wilson, Alton Lellis, Owen Gray, Honey Boy. Um, then we went on tour with Culture. Quite a few other bands mm. we, we went on. Um, Boomtown Rats, Shawadi Wadi. Really? The Cars, Tin Lizzy. But that, by that time we were signed to a record company, mm. RCA. So we was like the support groups. So we'd go, and go on before mm. most of those groups. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So you did support work um, and you spoke about playing the bass, but actually you have an amazing voice. Well, what when did you start singing? Well, what happens was well, they had a club called Burton's and Spinners and quite a few clubs. So every night, every Friday night, we used to go there. I thought we weren't doing a show and um, I'd hear all these fantastic guys singing. John Holt, Delroy Wilson, Dobby Dobson, Pat Kelly. Ken what, here Duke, in the UK? In the UK hearing their music play within the club. Mm. So I used to mimic how they used to sing. So when we're walking home, because that time we weren't driving cars then, so about five of my friends would be walking in front of me and I'd be behind singing the songs what I've heard that night. And if I didn't oh. remember it, I'd either buy the record mm -hmm. or I'd go back the following week and get the second piece or the second verse of that song. So I put it all together. So when I did stop playing the bass, I joined up with Christopher Henry, Leslie McNeil, mm -hmm. Uh, Tony and Paul Thompson, most of the three of us went to school, four of us went to school together. So they said, I've got a little band. So I said, all right, I'll come down and see what's going on. Went down there and realized that obviously I couldn't play bass. You couldn't Chris, play? No, because Christopher okay. Henry was playing the bass already. So I went in there. So while they were jamming along, I just started to sing. And they said, boy, D, we didn't know you could sing. I said, well, I didn't neither. They said, well, let's just join the band and become one of the singers. And that's how it progressed from there. So you hadn't really been doing any kind of singing, you hadn't None really thought all. about being a singer? No, the first time I started to sing was when I joined Tradition. What a masterstroke. <laughs> so you can play music, you can yeah. sing music. So you're known as a singer-songwriter. Right. So do you write and oh, yeah. sing and play? Tell us about that, how you feel oh, well, about writing songs. Well, the writing of the songs, that's how, how it started. Um, when, I was, when I was playing with Tradition, it, there was no pen to paper. It was okay. all like, you heard, I heard the track and then whatever came out of my head, that's what I was seeing. So Natural Woman was never written. I never should put pen to paper, that was one take. So you kind of made it up as you went uh, along? As I, I was, yeah, one take. Cause I was, as I was singing, the words were coming. I don't know where they're coming from, but they were coming. I was going to um, ask you what inspires your writing? Uh, situations, you think of a situation and then I just back it up. Each time I say a line, then why I'm, why I'm, when I'm singing that line, I'm thinking of the next line to sing. Mm. And that's, how, that's what I would do. To love someone, it's the same thing. I never wrote that neither. That was one take. Damn it. Was, most of my songs were tradition and my solo career. They're all one takes, just coming from the top of my head. It's only recently, since the lockdown now, okay. from March coming up, I've actually started to put pen to paper. And I've written about maybe 16, 17 songs. So you're saying when you first started, mm -hmm. the songs would come as they did, yeah. sentence after sentence. You're right. And we've just spoken about the fact that you've been in the, the music industry for coming up 50 years. Right. And you're saying that just last year, just, last just year. during this lockdown period, yeah. you've only started writing your songs Only now. started to put pen to paper. Because of the time, we've had the time because of the lockdown, obviously. Mm. Um, I've got my studio in my house with my cousin, uh, Mikey's put together for me. So that's given me an opportunity to be work, work by myself without any interruptions. No one's saying do this or do that. So 
as the tracks have been sent to me, I put them on and I can record straight away. And I just happened to get some pen and just started to write one day and it's like, I can't stop. Wow. So all of these you're saying, they're just situations that come situations, to you whilst yeah. you're... Um... Well, yeah. Or someone will say something to me and I'll say, okay, let me go home and look at that and I'll just put the rest to it and go, yeah, that situation, something's going to come out of it. Mm. Or what would she say to him or what would he say to her? And that's how I, I put them together. Nice. And so, of all the songs you've either written, mm -hmm. not written but sung, uh, do you have a favourite? Uh, I'm going to be honest, not really. Not really. I mean, Natural Woman is there um, to love someone, but I, I haven't personally got a favourite. Maybe within the new songs, what I'm writing now, there is mm -hmm. a couple inside there okay. what I think really is going to, you know, um, would I say do something for me? Because the way how the business is right now, mm. um, as far as making money and, and getting the fame, that's, that's not really there for me. It's just the fact that I can still do what I'm doing to this day. Sure. Still writing and make music, finding chorus lines and punch lines that if anybody hears that they can say, yeah, I love that song and can still dance to it. Mm. You know, because a lot of the songs what we wrote 30, 40 years ago, they're played over and over and over again. And that's a good thing because they're, they're not dying out, but it's good Absolutely. to have something new now mm. coming into the business where you can still go, yeah, that was on the same kind of par as the maybe natural woman or to mm. love someone. So that's why I'm trying to aim to get some songs just like that. So you spoke about being 15. Um, you went on tour in the mm -hmm. van, etc. You did get a trade, but what were some of the challenges you faced uh, going from having, you know, played the song, sung the words that you've created? Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges you faced? Uh, I, at that time, I, we weren't really getting. I wasn't really getting any challenges because everything was just open. The business was just thriving then, mm. as far as um, I can say, lovers rock, because we were just out there. And nothing, there was no barriers in our way. Everything was just going up and up and up. Because I said, told another person a couple of days ago, mm. when my friends were saying to him, look, when we went into the, into the studios to make music, we didn't go to make Lovers Rock. We went in there just to make music. And a lot of them was love songs. Mm. A lot of them was Roots songs. If you listen to traditional albums, there's a lot of Roots songs on there. And a lot of Lovers, lovers mm. on there as well. So the Lovers what we know today, it got branded with the name. So I can say a lot of the artists, maybe 91, 92, someone would say, yeah, I want to go and make a Lover's Rock song. Mm. But the majority of us, we did not go into studios to make a Lover's Rock song. We just made, it was just music. So tell me about that, Paul, because I know that that was quite a, a fond era for you, that time mm -hmm. of Lover's Rock, um, as well as being a performer, you know, and you created music, etc. What was life like? What were raves like? What were people wearing? What were people oh, talking man. about? Um, how, how were they dressing? <laughs> what did they look like? Tell me about that. Well, to me personally, it's the best. I think it was one of the best times for me and a lot of uh, my age group and the younger age group who came up in that era. We were dressing. Um, the guys that we never used to buy trousers off of the rack. Everything was cut. You, you wouldn't go and buy it. No. As in tailor made? Tailor made. Everything was tailor made. The brogues. Um, the, the Ben Shermans, the hats, everybody w was impressing themselves. Like, if I went to buy a pair of trousers and cut a trousers up, I would say to my, I'd ask my friend, Roy, what do you think of that? And he'd go, Paul, I don't like that. And just on his word, I wouldn't take that material. Mm -hmm. So we weren't dressing like for women out there. We were just dressing for the style, just to look good when we went out there. And as far as the music was concerned, it was just, as far as it was off the hook, it was, you couldn't wait to leave work on a Friday mm. to go home have a bath, and by eight o'clock, we were through the door, heading to the clubs. Not like now when you, a lot of us leave at our house at 12 or one sure, o'clock. Sure. No, by one o'clock, we, we were back home in bed. So it was early raves? Yeah, we were raving like a, a, a youth club first, and then from the youth club, we'd go back to Burton's or um, any one of the other clubs. And the music, it just, it was, it was all about love. A lot, a lot of love music was mm. going on at that time. And um, there were lots, lots of roots music as well. You know, as they say, we'd rub off the wallpaper off the wall. And, and it's funny, when they say that, I've never seen anybody going with wallpaper on the back of their... Of their but if you, not, never, <laughs> but, but, you know, it was gone. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if you've never seen the, the telltale yeah, signs a, of, a, of, a, of a great evening. Right. Of a great evening. So you were, though, someone who was instrumental in bringing Lovers Rock to all of us here in, in the UK. Um, who were some other Lovers Rock artists that you kind of did some work with, you performed with? Oh, so many. Of, oh, God. Carol Thompson, Janet Kay, Victor, Trevor Hartley, Louisa Mark, 
15, 16, 17. Um, oh my gosh, Mike Anthony, Trevor Waters, Michael Gordon. There's just, t- there's just too many, too many. of us. You're, you're worried you might leave some of yeah, that, tra- right? Yeah, tradition, yeah. There's just so, so many of us. So many of us that um, it's just, I just can't explain it. There's, we're out there and we're still, we're still friends. We still, you know, talk about the music side of it mm-hmm. and still try to do things together. Obviously, Winston Reedy, I don't know if I mentioned Winston Reedy. Um, Kofi, Brown Sugar, Barry Boom, um, Dennis Pinnock. There's, there's loads of us. That's a lot. <laughs> That there's would be us. an amazing concert. Oh yeah! Imagine well, having everybody together. That would be phenomenal. yeah. We're working with Orlando on Giants of Lovers Rock, um, one of the biggest shows you, well, I've known. Obviously, Mikey Coo's done his singles really. Carol Thompson used mm. to do it, and Janet Kay. Um, and we're all together. Sometimes there's there's 25 of us. Sometimes there's 26 of us backstage. So mm. you can imagine the excitement and the vibe. What's going on backstage? Absolutely. When everybody's the girls are in their change room. The boys are in their change room. Everybody's dressing up. Doing what, you know, putting on the aftershaves and the girls are dressing up and just, and we're all lined up behind the back of the stage. A lot of people don't know when they're calling the artists, we're all in the line. Like what, on does, what does that feel like? It's like, it's a buzz because you're, you're waiting to go on because you're watching your colleague go before you and you're cheering them on and going, you know, that nice Winston Gomez and he's, you know, getting the crowd ready. So when it's your time now, everybody can see everybody shaking like, they, like they're going for a run. You know, everybody just, you know... Is that the adrenaline build? The, yeah, every, yeah. Everybody just can't wait to go on to sing their song and do their best. And there's no like, oh, I've got to go before you or you've got to go before me. Because in the business, there's nobody better than anybody. Mm. You know, so if, if you've got to go on first or second or third, just go on and shine, do what you need to do and then come off. And the next person. And the next person goes on and do what they have to because they're out there waiting for all of us. So it doesn't matter what, if you go first or last, it doesn't really matter as far as nice, I'm concerned. Nice. You were with Tradition, the band Tradition, mm-hmm. uh, for a couple of years. Yeah. And then you left to be, you know, begin your solo career. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, I was Tradition for about five, six years. We were signed to RCA. And then I decided that it's time for me to move on and do something as, as Paul Dawkins. Um, so I went to D-Roy Records first. Mm-hmm. And we've done uh, Little Girl first. Um, then we have done Natural Woman. And then we've formed the group Eptics. Eptics was the name what I had in my mind for, from ages. What I like to have, you know, three or four guys sing together. So I had that name. So I used that name um, to, come, to put myself out there as another, as another group. And it kind of worked. What did that name mean to you? I, it didn't mean, it, I don't know where it came from. Eptics, it just, it just sounded nice. And if I could get, you know, three or four guys together, it would sound nice. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eptics. It just That's had good, that yeah, ring. Yeah, it just yeah. had that ring. So, um, I'd done that first and then after leaving Delroy, I went to um, Arat Records mm-hmm. and then uh, I went there as Paul Dork because I'd done To Love Someone and a couple of songs with um, Arawak and then I left from there. I was like throwing myself all over the place mm. just to get my name out there. Then I went to Starlight Records and I'd done some stuff with Popsy, uh, Come My Baby and Spend Some Time where Gene Alabama actually sang on some harmonies on one of my tracks mm. when we was in the studio. Because we was recording one day and um, we needed some harmonies. It was me, Angus Gay, and Tony Robinson and George Oban. And um, she was in the student next door. So I went and said, Jean, do you mind come, mind come doing some harmonies? And she said, Paul, I don't really do harmonies for anybody, but okay, I'll come and do something. And to me, that was a joy. Wow. To have Jean Alabama sing. I actually put her name on one of my, on the LP as well, mm. on the single. She sang by Jean Alabama. But it was, it was good times. It was good times. Because my name... It wasn't like out there. I was still stuck with tradition. Mm-hmm. And then you had all the Pete and girls. You had the Michaels and the, the Victors. And so I wanted a name like that. So it took me nearly, I think about 11, 11 years to get my name as Paul Dawkins. Out of as the, a into, solo artist. As a solo artist. It took me about 11, 12 years to do that. Because I'd go on stage and people go, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Dawkins. And they'd look to go, who is he? So once, once I started... What, what does that do to your adrenaline? So you've spoken about being behind the stage, you're in line, and you know, you're trying to get n- known, and they say, Paul Dawkins up next, and there's not much from the audience. What, how do you bring that around? When they say Paul Dawkins, it's like I've achieved what I wanted. Brilliant. When they say Paul Dawkins, I can hear them going, yeah, they're clapping now, because they know who I am. Where before, as I said, they mentioned Paul Dawkins, you wouldn't hear that. Until well, actually when I start to sing the song now, they'd go, oh, 
he's the guy who sang the mm. song. So there was a big division of my name with the song. So now I think that people know who I am and they can put me with those songs. What about being in a rave and hearing your song? Um, you know what? It, it, do I get embarrassed? Would I say that? Or I don't know. I tend to just go into a shell and just... Well, I hope they don't see you. And hope they don't see me. It's, it's a funny, it's a kind of funny feeling. I don't push my head out there and say, here I am. I'd rather just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. just be humble just and be, hold yeah. my corner. And I can say, yes, I've achieved by watching the people dance and sit long to my... And when they lift it up and play it back again, I go, yeah, I've achieved what I wanted to do within the business. Absolutely. You, you've, done, you've done a great job. Well, um, I hope I have. <laughs> yeah, you've done, a, you've done an absolutely great job. So I want to think now... Um, Paul, about the fact that you were so uh, hooked on being a great artist and being recognised that you decided that you wanted to actually recognise some other people in the industry and you created an award. Yeah, so what, what it was, I was at home one day and I said to myself, you know, the awards were going out and I said, why can't I create an award for myself? And I started thinking, what can I do? And I went, artist to artist. And I said, what's behind that? Artist to artist. I had to think about it first and I said, yeah, we as artists, if we can actually give our own friends within the business, other than outside mm. influence coming in, that would be nice. So, you know, you've got singers, you've got musicians. It was aimed at everybody, songwriters, um, players of instrument, bass players who, because without the, the, the guys who play the guitars and the basses and the, the drums and stuff, we can't really do anything without them. Mm. So I have to take off my hat to all of those guys within the studio and without the studio, because without them, we couldn't go on stage and make the music what we made today. So, and a lot of, a lot of musicians actually created the feels of the songs mm. what we sing today. Because Natural Woman comes from a soul guy who actually played bass. Oh, really? And he's a soul bass player. Mm. But, you know, he created that bass line and I think that's why I, I lived on that and, and prayed on that and came up with those lyrics because of that. So, you know, that, that, that award to me was one of the greatest things I think I could have done one of, one of to say look let's give some of our comrades I mean I gave um, Bubblers one I think Carol Thompson got one um, I think and then King Sounds came to me and asked me if he could use the award and I said yeah it's not a problem and he gave it to Dimples and Owen Gray and quite a few people that mm. award's gone to already but I'm thinking of starting it back up again that'd be fantastic because that, yeah. that whole kind of peer-to-peer -peer support is really yeah. uh, amazing. I really admire mm -hmm. the fact that you did that. That's mm -hmm. really important. Let's think now about whether you have had a life-changing experience in relation to music that changed the way you performed, that changed the way you moved. Um, no, I think just, just being a singer, being a singer and a, and a play of instruments, I think that's just scoped my life in a different kind of way because I still got that to fall back on whenever... I am doing my nine to five. It's mm. something what, you know, to me is one of the greatest things I know. People say, Paul, you're so lucky because you can, if you're not working, you can do singing or you can play an instrument mm. or you can write or help somebody else to, to, do, to get where they want to get. Because most of my colleagues in the business, if someone, phone, someone will phone me and say, Paul, who do you think can, and, I, and I'll call names. Mm. I'll say, why don't you use Audrey Scott? Why don't you use JJ Bourne to sing? or Paul at Taja or someone, I'll call someone else's name or someone say, Paul, do you want to come and do a bit? I say, no, you know, use that person instead. Give them mm. a break, give them a break. I've had my time in the sense that I've sang for you three times already, but give that person, to know that I can do that for somebody else, that, that's... That's brilliant. You know? Who do you most admire? Wow, oh, the list is long. Maybe let's have your top three. Top, top three, three within the business right now? Or back in the day, whenever, what, you know. What, in, in the Lover's Rock or in a, in a hole? Because I, I guess maybe just as a reggae artist. Because, reggae artist. Um, Lover's Rock is, is part of the, the, the reggae genre. Well, who, who I'm really looking at right now as, a, as an up-and-coming artist, who I think really, really sure I've got to mention is JJ Born to Sing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mikey Spice. Oh, I love Mikey sorry, Spice. Did I, uh, you know, I, I love, I love Mikey, Mikey Spice, Spice yeah, as well. His, his tone and the way he sings, love Mikey Spice. And um, I would say Alton Ellis. Mm. I would say Alton Ellis. Yeah, that's great. That's, that, that's nice. Yeah. Because there are probably people that say the same about you. There are mm. definitely people that have listened to your music mm -hmm. uh, that have fond memories 
uh, okay. of your music, and some of them have probably had children as a result. <laughs> Who was to know? As a result of some of the songs right. that you sung, because it was all about lovers, and we've right. spoken about that era and what that, that meant for you. Mm-hmm. If you were going to be stuck in a lift with somebody, who would it be and what would you ask them? Wow, oh my gosh. Stuck in a lift. Which well, is gone now, it would be Louisa Mark. Oh. My good friend Louisa. What would you say to her? And I said, Louisa, we've got to do a tune together. We've got to do a song together. Let's get together and write a song together. Louisa Mark. That is fantastic. That would have been a real song, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Because just before um, we lost Louisa, she phoned me. Uh, there was a big show coming up and she phoned me from Gambia. And I said, hello, who's mm. that? And she goes, Paul, is Louisa. I said, Louisa? She goes, Paul, it's me, Louisa Mark, because when she's ready, she can... I says, Paul, it's me. I said, Louisa, where are you? Are you here? She goes, no, I'm in Gambia. She was actually in the shop looking oh. for some garments to come over to, do, to actually do the show. And she says to me, Paul, when I come over, I'm going to come and stay with you for a couple of days. I said, Louisa, not a problem. And then I think it was about, I think about three or two weeks later, I got a call from, I think it was Winston Reedy. Mm. And that was about early in the morning time that Louisa just passed. I cried because, you know, I couldn't believe that I lost a friend Mm. like that, you know? That was a sad moment as well for the the industry. So I can imagine you having that connection with her. What that would have, um, what that would have felt Definitely like. Definitely Louise on the lift. <laughs> I like that. That's good. I can, I can see why, and that would have been an amazing yeah. track, as I said. Paul, what do you think uh, you would say to young people now? Because you were fifteen when you were doing this. A fifteen-year-old who was interested in music. What advice would you give him now? Well, the first thing I tell him to do before you go and you come into the music, make sure you've got some form of education or a trade mm. behind you. That's number one. Yeah, and if you're going to come into the business, come into the business and know the business, not just playing the instrument or singing. Mm. You've got to know the background, the paperwork, when it comes to PRS, your writing and protecting your songs. Mm. And who you're actually dealing with as a producer or as a manager. Because once you start to sing and all of a sudden you'll see a manager pop up from nowhere. Mm. Because at the end of the day, there's something in it for them. But a manager, as far as I'm concerned, they actually help you on that path to get where you want to, to go. Mm. Not just to reap the rewards because they're your manager or you've got to answer to them. So get that part right and then you can move on from there. But all, always remember, have something to fall back on. That's great advice because I think we can get carried away with whatever our individual craft yes. is. Uh, but then when it becomes as a business, it's, it's right. a totally different thing. I was just thinking, were you self-taught? In terms of the guitar, I know you've got the guitar that didn't have many strings. Yeah, yeah, I was self-taught. Um, what happened was, while me and Brinsley was playing, um, George Oban and Tony was obviously helping out. But by this time now, you're, you're getting to know the guitar, the instrument, what you've got, it becomes part of you. But what happened was, Bob Marley came to Neesden. I think it was about 72, 73, mm. he came to Neesden. And um, he was living like, not even five minutes from us. And Delroy Washington, God rest his soul now, he sure. brought me and Brinsley round to Bob's house. And, um, you know, as far as I know, for, I, I can say it's a pleasure to know that I've actually been in Bob Marley's present, presence and sit, that sat down with him, played music with him. But the bass player, Family Man, he, used, he started to give me bass lessons and come around to my, my house um, in Neesden, Dorpo Road. And, you know, he gave me some bass lines and told me how to use the bass, you know, how to warp the bass. And he actually gave me a bass line, what I still have to this day. Mm. I've never actually recorded it. And he said, Paul, any time you, re- you record this song, song, he will know that it was me. So that's, that's my part of, you know, getting to know the bass and learning the bass. Because I think my stuck in the lift, I think one of the people would definitely be Bob Marley. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, or outside his house on the, the, the concrete. But it, he'd definitely be one. So I think right. that's fantastic mm-hmm. that you've had that experience. Paul, you spent lots of time in Gangsterville Record Shop. Oh, yes, yes. Um, that's where practically tradition lived, because um, there was a room upstairs and um, four of us lived, practically lived in that, re- in that record shop. And that's where we create a lot of um, the songs like A Little Bit of My Heart, Breezing, Gambling Man, Moving On, you know, What You Walk On By. Because we'll be up there, we'll be sitting down, we'll be singing and all of a sudden we go, this tune sounds nice, let's go downstairs. It's mm-hmm. only three, four o'clock in the morning. And we turn on the instruments and because of where it was, it didn't really disturb anybody. So. By the next morning, in up, well, by the afternoon that day, we'd put those songs together. But that was a place where we left to go do our shows from. 
all our instruments and everything was mm. um, was was there. And obviously there was a record shop in front, so we'd hear all the new releases coming mm. in, and we'd actually hear our songs playing as well. Once they came back from the uh, from the press, that's where we'd hear it first inside the record shop. But so that was. That was a part of our life, going to the record shop. And, and did you uh, receive an award for breezing? Yeah, from I think it was uh, Black Echoes. Mm. Yeah, that's our first award we got um, breezing. Tell and us about Black Echoes. What was Black Echoes? It was a, it was a paper music paper. Um, it had all different things, but it was like a reggae chart what they'd have in there. Mm. So every week, that's the first thing that everybody would run yeah. to go and look. Who's at number ten? Who's at number three? So we do that every week. I think it was every Wednesday. I think it used to come out. I'm not sure every Wednesday, but. That was a paper, and I don't know what's happened to it now. I was thinking there were no publications like that anymore, so that was really something at its time. Yeah, because one of the guys who used to work with Becca, I think it was Snoopy. It was a white guy named Snoopy. Mm. He actually sang on Airgasm, This Is Lover's Rock. Oh, really? Yes, a lot of people don't know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was one. It was him, Dennis Pinnock and Tyrone actually sang on This Is Lover's Rock. Yeah. Paul, 50 years in the industry. Yeah, yeah. Is there some more to come? Yes, um, I'm right. I'm, I've got a couple of songs. Well, I've got about 15 songs I've, I've wrote. And actually, when I leave here today, I'm going to go and get one of the mixed um, from Derek Fedro. Um, and it's, I think it's going to do something. I'm not looking for, say, the money, but as far as the vibe is concerned and people can dance to it. And that's what I'm really looking for. And is this one of the songs you've actually written down? Have you penned These this are one? one of the songs what I've written down. Definitely, definitely. I've had time to be creative on it and move it around because sometimes when you're doing a one take, you're singing straight from out of your head. But this time now, as I'm singing, I'm writing and I'm stopping and going, no, I can move it and put that there. And, and that's what I've been doing. So it's been very creative. I'm looking songs. forward to that. I certainly yeah. haven't been uh, raving listening to music for, yeah. for 50 years. <laughs> but I do want to say I've heard your music mm. for decades and decades. Um, I absolutely adore the songs that you sing. So I do want to end by saying, that you have agreed to do a really amazing uh, PA for us. Uh, what's the song you're going to sing? Um, Natural Woman. You're going to sing Natural yeah. Woman. An absolute favourite. I'm really excited. Listen, Paul Dawkins, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, spending time with you Thank here you. on Patricia Talks. And uh, we're going to hand it over to you to do your PA. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you ever much. so much. Thank you. Cool. Hi, I'm Paul Dawkins. I'm going to sing one of my tracks for you I wrote many, many years ago, and it's entitled Natural Woman. Mm -hmm. 